Jude. If you have the book of Jude, shout amen. amen. I want you to look down. Let's, let's, let's look down around verse number 20 together. We're going to look down at verse number 20 together if you don't mind doing that. Uh, I'm going to read the first version out of the, the New King James. And it would say this, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and have compassion on some, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now, some of you may not fully understand all the context of the text that I just read there, so I'm going to read it again starting at verse number 20. Build yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Look at your neighbor and say, build yourself up. Build now, the only way to do that is through exhortation. If you do that on your own, you have to do it through praying in the Holy Spirit. You have to pray in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Can, you, can somebody just give me an amen that praying in the Spirit is necessary? There you go. That's, that's about half of you. Praying in the Spirit is necessary. That's not the focus, though. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. I want to get down to verse 22. And on some have compassion, making a, a distinction. But on others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. What does that mean? If you don't mind, I'm going to read this same text to you out of the NLT. And I'm going to start at verse number 21, reading this to you out of the New Living Translation. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that early so I can give the media guys time to do what they need to do because they don't have any notes or, uh, to go on this morning. They're getting it as I get it. Verse 21 in the NLT, and it would say this, and, and, and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ who will bring you to eternal life. How do you get to eternal life? Jesus Christ. There is no other way. You cannot combine your religion with the religion of the Quran and think to yourself that you can get to heaven that way. The only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ your Lord. That's the only way. You will keep yourself safe in God's love. Verse 22. And you must. Everybody say, I must. I must, I must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. I must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Not everybody's always going to have great faith. And, you know, sometimes people struggle. If you haven't struggled this morning, you're probably not telling us the truth, and you're probably not human. I struggle. You struggle. Not every day do you always feel like being the SC super Christian. Not every day do you feel like your faith is where it needs to be. Not every day do you want to talk about everybody and, and tell them how happy you are and share all your goods. There's just some days that you don't feel like everybody else wants you to feel. Amen. There are days where you have to paint on your smile. Can I get an amen? amen. But we are to have mercy on those whose Faith may be wavering. Verse 23 is where I want to get to. Rescue others by snatching them literally from the flames of judgment. Today all of you are going to be inducted as firemen. I'm going to come back to this verse here in just a moment. Rescue others. Everybody say rescue. Rescue, rescue others by snatching them. Do you know what it means to snatch something. When you snatch something, ha anybody in here a good thief? <clears throat> Nobody willing to admit it anyways. It takes sometimes a good thief or just a really brave person to snatch something from somebody else's possession. But there are necessary times that we are called to snatch other people from the flames of judgment. Now let me pause just for a moment before I get into this. How many of you are truly thankful that you're on your way to heaven? Amen. There you go. 
truly thankful that you're on your way to heaven. How many of you are truly thankful that you have been saved? Amen. Amen. How many of you in, in, in this room this morning know that beyond a doubt that should the trumpet of God sound right now that you're on your way to heaven? Amen. You know beyond a doubt. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and say this. Not everybody in this room has the same assurance that you have. There are some folks in this room right now who aren't real sure that if today was their day that they would make heaven. They're not positive on that. How many of you love your family? Amen. Anybody love their grandkids? Amen. Oh yeah, anybody love their grandkids more than their kids? Amen. Anybody love your pet? Anybody love your boss? Anybody love your spouse? He heard you. She, she had to turn around to see if he noticed. <laughs> Elementary heard you. You heard, right? Okay. We love all the people that's in our lives. How much do you love them? Would you die for them? Some of them you would. Some of them you think you would, but you're not really sure unless you were in that, that situation. But the truth is, we are surrounded by people, friends, family, co-workers, that will miss eternity should eternity come right now. If I were at a restaurant with you today, if you and I were sitting at a restaurant, and outside of that restaurant was a person who was clearly down on their luck, they weren't asking for anything, they didn't have a sign, they weren't begging for anything, they were just clearly down on their luck. Let's say that you saw an elderly woman sitting in a rocking chair at Cracker Barrel today and you, you went there at 1 o'clock and you saw this elderly woman and then for whatever reason you drove back by there six hours later and you still saw this lady sitting there and you could know that she was hungry and that she needed food. The majority of you would go in and make sure that this woman has something to eat, would you not? You would want to take care of her. What if you left today and you, and you found a five-year-old just roaming the streets of Fairmont? Nobody was looking after this five-year-old. Most of you would stop your vehicle to assist this five-year-old to ensure that this five-year-old would get home safe. Would you not? Now, I say most of you because the world is always going to be full of people that won't help nobody. Even people who call themselves Christians, there's a few of them that just won't help nobody but themselves. You're going to get, you're going to get real preaching and truth preaching in this church this morning. I'm just going to tell you. What if I told you this morning that if I didn't get $1,000 by tomorrow, that I was going to lose everything I own? If I told you that, I have no doubt that before I left today, I'd have that and more. Yet you will come to encounter numbers of people today who should the trumpet sound at this moment will miss eternity and as the old saying goes, split hell wide open. Why is it that it's so easy for me to give you a 20? Why is it so easy for me to give you Cracker Barrel? Why is it so easy for me to offer to cut your grass? Why is it so easy for me to roll down my window and throw 88 cents at you as you stand there with your sign, but it's so difficult for us to share the love of Jesus with those in our lives? How many people right now, I want you to think of your 20 
closest friends and relatives. The people that if you, sur- if you surrounded yourself right now with 20 people, how many of those 20 do not know Jesus? And what are you doing to change that? What are you doing to change the fact that in this county alone, I, I can't talk about other counties, but in Marion County we have 56,000 people and 40 or so of them, 40,000 or so of them, do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. What are we doing as a church to change that? Pastor, how am I supposed... I can't, I, I, well, you know, it's, it's, not really, it's not really my thing to witness to people. If it's not your thing to witness to people, then it is your thing to send them to hell. Whew. It just got heavy. If it is not your thing to talk to them about Jesus, then it is your thing to be okay with them Accepting hell. Now, it's different if you try to talk to them and they won't refuse it. That's totally different. Not everybody's going to receive it. Ask Jesus. He'll tell you. His own family wouldn't receive it. He's the Messiah. He's, he's working miracles and signs and wonders. And, and even his own, own family won't receive it. Not everybody's going to get it. But I'm going to say it again. If you're not okay and if you're not comfortable trying to get people into the kingdom, then you're okay pushing them out of the kingdom. You're going to do one of two things with everybody in your life. You're either going to assist them into hell or get them into heaven. Oh, he's preaching now. It was, y'all were on my side just a few moments ago. And if you don't do one of those two things, then you do nothing at all. And doing nothing at all will cause God to look at you one day and say, you lazy servant. Y'all, we preach that now. Pastor, how should I look at those in whom are in my life? I want you once again to look at verse number 23, if you don't mind. 20, verse 23, Jude, verse number 23, and it would say this. Rescue, rescue, literally rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. So let me ask you this question as you see this. If you were driving home today... And you passed a house, and that house was on fire, and three feet on, in, inside of the main door, the door was open, and three feet in is a person standing there just like this, nonchalantly could care less that the house around them is about to cave in. Would you just drive by and honk your horn and say, have a great day? Okay, a few would. But the majority of you would stop your car, get out of your car, call 911, yell at the neighbors, scream, help, help, somebody help. And you would run in that house and get that person and and your energy would kick in and you, even as a little person, would carry them. If they're unwilling to move, you would pick them up and carry them out yourself. Would you not? That's what this verse is telling us to do. We need to look today when you drive through the, the drive through or go to your restaurant or go home, you need to see these people as if they are in they are in danger of the flames of judgment. Every person you know that don't know Jesus is in danger of the flames of judgment. There's people in here right now. You are in danger of the flames of judgment because either you don't have Jesus as your Savior or you pretend that you do, but yet you live a life that is hypocritical as to the Word of God. You are in danger of the flames of judgment. It is my duty and my job. It is what God requires. Not my job because I'm a preacher. It's my job because I'm saved to tell you that Jesus loves you and that if you don't accept Him, you'll miss heaven. It's your obligation as a Christian, not because you're a preacher, not because you're a pastor. It is your obligation to rescue others by snatching them. Literally snatching them 
out of the flames of judgment. Rescue them. I thought to myself, I, I keep saying to myself, Lord, how? And then the Lord reminds me, Lord, what do we need to do to grow your church? And he says, don't focus on growing the church, focus on growing the kingdom. Amen. And don't focus on just growing your church, grow the church. Amen. Lord, how, how do we do that? What, what's, what's the process in which we need to do that? Because I see an empty seat here. I see empty seats there. People are on vacation. It's the summertime. I see empty. You know what? Just so happens that I see empty seats in every section. And yet there's 40,000 people in this county who do not attend a church. And I have to ask myself, what are we doing to change the statistics that people, even in this county, don't know who Jesus is. And you would say to yourself, it's impossible for people in this county, it's impossible for people in the United States not to know who Jesus is. I'm going to tell you there are people that live on your street that don't know who Jesus is. God give us a desire to see everyone we come in contact as if they are standing inside of a house and that house is in flames and they need rescued from the flames of judgment. Now, the book of Jude is a real good book. So then I go back and I... Who, who without me turning to it, who can tell me what Matthew 28, 19 tells us to do. Just go ahead. Go, go ye therefore and what? Make disciples. I'm going to ask you again. How many of you are saved? Now everybody's nervous to answer questions, man. Everybody's like, I'm not sure if I should answer any more. I'm not answering any more questions. <laughs> Y'all are not in trouble. <laughs> Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, Go therefore into all the world and make disciples. You've got to convert people to make disciples, do you not? Amen. What, what is the one single most important thing Jesus wants me to do? You see, we've confused what Jesus wants. And what we want. We've confused our duty of going to church. If I do that, then I'm good. You know what? You are good. We praise God that you're saved. But if you're not doing this, then you're not doing your job. Go ye therefore. This was Jesus' last command. Go therefore and make disciples. He didn't stop there. Then you, you have the, the correlation in the, in the Acts chapter 1 verse number 8 where he said, But you shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And when you receive power, then you'll be what? Witnesses. Come on, don't be nervous, people. Then you'll be witnesses unto me uh, in, in Judea, Samaria, and where? The uttermost part of the, of the earth. Jesus' main desire for you is that you take what you've received and you give it to somebody else. Freely you've received, freely give. Freely received, freely give. Go ye therefore and make disciples. Go. So I, here, let's just, let's just do this. It's going to be hard, but we're just going to do it. I want you today, when you leave this place, I want you to start visualizing every person you see in a burning house. And see if that changes your approach. I'm 39 years old. I'll be, I'll be 40 in a month. Some of the greatest joys of my life is when the Lord has given me an opportunity to lead people to Jesus Christ. 
Some of the greatest joys of my life is being able to assist people into the kingdom. Not to grow our church, but to grow the kingdom. Some of the greatest joys of my life is knowing that in, in, in multiple nations right now, I've preached in three nations physically. We preach through the internet right now in upwards of 20 nations. What a joy it is to know that we have part of leading people to Jesus. The numbers are staggering in the amount of believers who have never led and don't witness to others in leading them to Jesus. We, we begin to, to think to ourselves, it's the, it's the job of the church to do that. It's the job of the pastor to do that. Let, let, let me tell you, it is the job of the fivefold ministry to equip people who are already saved. Oh, come on. Y'all going to make me preach long today. I said it's the job of the five-fold office ministry to equip and perfect the saints for the ministry. It's not the job of the five-fold ministry by themselves to go out and convert everybody. Evangelists are supposed to go out. That's their specialty, man. Go out and, and convert people to the kingdom of God. But you see, they're supposed to get saved before they get here. Somebody, somebody yelled at us, and you know, because I, I'm a believer that every church service needs to have an altar call. And every church service should have some type of an altar call. But when you miss one, you have those people, and they're like, how dare you miss an altar call? And what I sometimes want to do is turn around and say, when's the last time you had an altar call? It is not the job of the church to get people saved. We do, and we're glad we do. It is, it is your job as a believer to lead people to Jesus Christ. It is the, job's church to, or the church's job to build them up. It is the church's job to build them up so they'll go out and do what you did to them. Pastor, pastor, what about an altar call? I'd love to do an altar call, but I would rather see two or three hundred people today go out into the community and do an altar call of their own. Imagine us not... All churches in this county and surrounding counties in North Central West Virginia not having enough room for all the people attending church. Why? Because all the Christians decided, I've got to have an altar call. Amen. Go ye therefore make, make disciples of all nations. Rescue them. Rescue them from the flames of judgment, pulling them in. I'm not going to read it for you, but in, in Luke Chapter 14, there's a, there's a story, and it says that the servant went out and began to compel people. to come. The master said, come, for now all things are ready. Y'all know that story, Luke 14. Come, for things, all things are now ready. And it says the servant went out and began to tell them to come in. And, and they all, the Bible says, they all begin to make excuse. You're going to witness to a lot of people who don't want to hear a thing about what you're talking about. The majority of them don't want to hear what you're talking about. So you have to keep laying little seeds. You have to keep showing the love of Christ. You've got to keep doing small things because not everybody is going to come. You know, hey, can, can, I, can I invite you to church? Sure. That usually don't happen. Can I talk to you about Jesus? Oh, I'd love to talk about Jesus. Usually you've got to build foundations. So the servant went out and he began to tell them, Come, the master said, come for everything is now ready. And, and it says that they all begin to make excuses. Anybody in this room got an excuse? No? Okay, good. <laughs> Nobody in this room got an excuse why they can't uh, witness and why they can't come to church and, and why, they, why they can't have faith and why they can't, why they can't. Why, no, uh, nobody in this room says, I can't. This is an awesome crowd. <laughs> Amazing. But one said, I bought a piece of ground. i got to go see it. Who buys a piece of ground without looking at it? <laughs> Any of you ever received a stupid excuse? <laughs> I was at work one time when I worked in the prison system. This guy called in one day. 
I said, hey, hey, what, what can I do for you? He said, I need to call off work. I looked at this guy and said, you're not scheduled to work. He said, I mean like in three weeks. <laughs> he said, I'm going to be sick that day. <laughs> Excuse me? I bought a piece of ground. The other one said, I bought some oxen. The other one, the third one, man, the third one was the only legitimate reason. He said, I've married a wife. If I just take off without telling her, I'm in trouble. <laughs> and it says that the servant came back and told his master that, that everybody had excuses. And the, and, the ma and the master was angry and he said, go out quickly. Go where? Go into the streets. Go into the lanes and go into the city and bring me in the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. Bring in people who need everything and can give nothing. Bring in people who need everything and can give nothing. Amen. But pastor, I, I like to surround myself with people who can give me something. He said, go get the poor, the lame, the maimed, the blind. Go get the down. Go get those that nobody else wants. Stop persecuting the world through your ignorance, telling them how bad they are, how sinful they are, stop being their judge and start telling them about the love of a Savior. Go out and get people who can give you nothing in return. You see, when you, when you minister to people who can give you nothing in return, then you will not be disappointed when you get nothing in return. And they'll trust you when they know that they can give you nothing, yet you love them in the love of the Lord. He didn't say go get the rich, go get the well-to-do, go get the stuck up, go get the hypocrites, go get, go get the church people. He didn't say any of that stuff. Go get the people who can give nothing back in return. And it says that, that, the, that the servant came back and said, Master, I've done what you ask, and still there is room. I'm telling you today, there is still room. There is still room. Look around you today. There is still room. This room is not heaven. This room is a room that is, that is built and designed for us to come in and praise Jesus and bless Jesus and worship God and equip and perfect the saints. That's what this room is about. This room, I'm going to say it again, you can get mad at me all you want, and yes, we'll still give altar calls. This room, church services were not designed to end with an altar call. Amen. Are you getting angry now? I'm getting it's truth. We can give altar calls. We will give altar calls. But we, we desire for everybody to be saved when they come in the door. They're saved when you talk to them at, at, at Cracker Barrel. They're saved when you're mowing your lawn and you stop and you witness to a neighbor. They're saved when you're walking through the hospital and you see a mama crying and you take the time to share the love of Jesus and maybe you invite them to church. Maybe you ask them if they know Jesus. Well, pastor, what do I do if somebody says they don't know Jesus? It's a good thing you ask that question. You need to be discipled. You need to give them the Romans road. You need to read the book of Romans. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You need to understand and in Romans, go find it for yourself. It says, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that you, that Jesus died, rose again, that you shall be saved. Amen. Oh, pastor, I thought it was about what church they attend. It's not about a church at all. Amen. It's not about Pentecostal, Baptist, Methodist, Covenant Church, South Ridge Church. Forget church. Sometimes church, it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's about rescuing. Rescuing those who are standing in hell's flame. Those who are in jeopardy. Church, I'm going to tell you, there's going to come a day. There's going to come a day that you're going to, you're going to it's going to be too late. Who in this room doesn't know Jesus? You know of Him, but you don't know Him. 
as I'm preaching right now? Is it in Singapore or Poland or Canada? Is it in Ghana? It, where is it that right now somebody's listening and they don't know Jesus? Not just in this room. The people in this room, I can touch you. But through that lens, we're preaching because of you sharing this last week. 60 shares. The sermon was viewed by almost 3,000 people. You did what we asked you to do. A couple hundred people listens to it on Sunday morning, and by Tuesday, 3,000 people throughout the world are having church with you. Pastor, how do I do it? I'll just, I'll give you the secret, okay? I'll just give you the secret. Romans chapter 10. If you don't know the Romans road, Get your Bible out. Mark this down. Romans chapter 10, verse number 9. Romans 10 and 9. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Who? The Lord Jesus. And believe in your heart. It's not just that you say, Lord Jesus. You have to believe what you're saying. A, B, C. Accept Him. Believe and confess. Confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead. You will be saved. For with your heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Verse number 13. For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's how you lead people to Christ. Can, Can I pray with you? Can I pray with you? A waitress, a cashier at Walmart, can, can, I, can I pray with you? I'm not asking you to go in there and act all a fool. I'm not asking you to go in there and make a display. I'm a super Christian. No, grab somebody's hand and just lead them to Jesus. And then tell them you need to find a good church. Get in a good church. Find a Bible-based church. Find a place where they're preaching. And if you don't have a church, here, here's my number. Look me up on Facebook. I go to this church. I, if you're not in a church... If you're not in a church that you're proud of, get out of it and find a church that you're proud of and find a church that you know is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Last thing I ask you today, who is going to be the next person that you'll lead to Christ? 